good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our EVAR 2020 ALTA webinar series. My name is Carlos Ortega here with Endologix. I want to welcome you all to the webinar today. Uh, joining me today are two esteemed guests of ours, uh, Dr. Steve Hanau. Uh, Dr. Hanau is an extremely active adopter and early adopter of the ALTO uh, you know, and polymer technology EVAR space. He's implanted hundreds of nearly 300 uh, implants so far of the polymer technology with excellent results in long-term follow-up. Dr. Hanau has also been one of our highest enrollers in the Elevate study for Alto and the Life and Lucy studies. So I want to welcome Dr. Steve Hanau. Also joining us is uh, Dr. Nick Mawad. Uh, Dr. Mawad is uh, Chief of Vascular Surgery at McLaren Bay Heart Vascular Center in Michigan. Um, Dr. Mawad is also uh, very familiar with our technology with nearly uh, 50 implants today uh, with polymer technology. So uh, both Dr. Hanau and uh, Dr. Mawad will lead us through a little bit of their early experience here uh, with Alto as we've introduced it here in the U.S. and also globally. Um, we'll, we'll introduce uh, the audience since there's you know, different uh, different familiarities out there with the technology itself. So we'll give you some, some uh, introductions to the technology. We'll spend some time reviewing some cases they've prepared for us. So uh, thank you, Dr. Hanau and Dr. Mawad for joining us. Before we launch into the presentation, I just want to do a couple things for, for housekeeping sakes for everybody that's joined us. Uh, on your screen, you'll see three windows. Uh, those three windows will be the slides themselves, a uh, small media window which where you'll see the speakers and or any videos that are presented today for the, the cases that Dr. Hanau and Mawada have prepared for us. There's also a chat function. Um, as you start uh, you know, uh, interacting uh, with the content today, if there's questions that you have, feel free to ask them anytime during the presentation. We'll allot some time at the end of our presentation to go through some of this Q&A and, and uh, have a chance to hear a little bit from doctors uh, now and Dr. Mawad about their experience and hopefully field some of your questions. Um, you'll also see just some four icons down below that help you toggle between the three, um, you know, kind of windows that we're interacting with uh, you, the audience, with. And obviously, there's a troubleshooting guide uh, that's in there if you need uh, any help. But I would encourage you, to, if you have any technical difficulties, to just ask your questions in the chat. And uh, someone from our support staff here on ON24, the platform we're using for this, will help you with your uh, questions. So without any further delay, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Hanau to kick us off here in our content today. Uh, again, thank you, Dr. Hanau and uh, Dr. Mawad for joining us. We really appreciate you making time uh, for the webinar today. So Dr. Hanau, the floor is yours. Well, I'd like to thank all of you that are uh, attending this live, as well as those of you that are accessing this on demand. Hopefully, this will give you an insight as to uh, why uh, you should be considering this new device as something that could be disruptive uh, in terms of uh, a new technology that could literally change the game in the way that we think about taking care of our patients. Uh, as many of you are familiar, when you start to evaluate the patient from the time you see them in the clinic and then the time that you review their CAT scan, you start to think about what exactly you're going to do for these patients. And maybe you've already pre-selected uh, your notion of how an aneurysm could be taken care of based off of you know, the last 20-some years of EVAR experience. And this is certainly something that should change the way that you evaluate your patients from here on, and, and I'll hopefully make a case for that going forward. Let's go back a little bit. So speaking of 20 years of the literal evolution and refinement of this device uh, or EVAR uh, in general, uh, this is something that is a departure from the uh, wire uh, and self-expanding technology therapy that was uh, literally uh, born from Juan Perotti's first experience. Uh, so this was uh, an architecture or a design that was born from the ground up. It was a white paper idea 
uh, back in 2002. Uh, initially, the first device was a unibody, uh, but still incorporated a certain type of polymer. And over the subsequent three years with the uh, Enovus in 2005 became uh, known for its super renal fixation, which continues now, uh, still with the first generation polymer or what we call the polymer one. And then the big uh, change here in 2009 where uh, the uh, company had uh, re-established control of the uh, intellectual property and it became a trimodular uh, device. So that's two docking limbs and a second generation polymer. Uh, and the incorporation of limbs that are extremely flexible, uh, extremely conformable, and uh, I think hold bragging rights for some of the best patency rates uh, for EVAR in terms of the limbs themselves. Uh, fast forward to 2012, where there was uh, the Ovation Prime, which demonstrated an improvement in the ability to position the device uh, in three-dimensional space so that you could align the contralateral limb exactly the way that you wanted so that it could uh, speed up the uh, case itself uh, and also included a contralateral leg tether uh, and a stiffer nose cone. And then three years later, the Ovation IX uh, was introduced in 2015 which established uh, another technology to allow for uh, ease of cannulation, uh, where you're able to go up and over and snare, similar to what we see in the AFX device, uh, with an integrated sheath as well, uh, longer, wider iliac limbs, and uh, the custom seal polymer as well. Uh, what we're gonna be expounding on tonight is uh, the latest generation of this technology, which is the Alto device, uh, most notable for being the, uh, I think, game breaker for the inferenal neck length required to establish the seal. Most devices require a 10 to 15 millimeter sealing uh, length. And uh, for this IFU on the Alto, it's seven millimeters. It also incorporates an integrated balloon uh, offset aortic body legs so that allows for ease of discrimination of which is the ipsilateral limb and which is the contralateral limb, and also webbing at the graft bifurcation. So when we talk about the manufacture of the device, uh, which is uh, done in Santa Rosa, California, uh, what I like to think of in terms of the final step of manufacturing is indeed when that polymer goes into the device and creates the custom seal uh, specific to each patient's anatomy. Uh, so it very meticulously conforms to each and every vessel wall irregularity, be that calcium or some fibrotic tissue or even thrombus, uh, without exerting any chronic radial force on the neck, which I think is probably the most disruptive part of this technology. By now, all of you are familiar with the vast uh, data out there that demonstrates that chronic outward force is uh, actually deleterious to the aortic neck and can create mayhem down the road and cause problems which, which can lead to long-term manifestations such as repressurization of the sac requiring secondary interventions. But of course, as many of you know, some patients don't actually make it uh, and this can lead to an outright rupture and death. So this is probably one of the things that gets called out about EVAR consistently. And by creating a region of uh, zero chronic outward radial force, uh, there is data to support from this ring technology that you can have outstanding and stable uh, neck diameters for years to come. So let's dive a little deeper into how this device, the Alto, differs specifically from the previous generation of these devices, the Ovation IX. Most notably, you can see on the Alto that the uh, crown of fixation is not actually any shorter or smaller. It's almost an optical illusion. What's happening here in the engineering is that the uh, entire crown or the suprarenal fixation is uh, further seated down into the uh, PTFE graft. 
Uh, and you can see on these drawings here the tether assembly, which is denoted by these black small arrows, um, and also the difference in the webbing at the graft bifurcation, which uh, imparts uh, some stability also in cannulation. I think that in combination with the polymer, once it's infused into the device, gives the device its uh, rigidity uh, and what have you. The IX, on the other hand, you can see that there is a shelf of PTFE above the primary sealing ring, which we call the sealing collar. Uh, that has been modified significantly in the Alta. Uh, the other difference here is that there are mirror image limbs uh, coming off of the aortic body. Uh, many times, if there's even a slight amount of parallax, it may be difficult to determine which is the ipsy and which is the contralateral limb. Whereas with the alto, you have a, a discrete staggering so that when the polymer outlines uh, the rings on each limb, you can definitely tell which is the ipsilateral and which is the contralateral. These are fine tweaks that were derived from literally hundreds and hundreds of uh, implantation of Ovation Prime and Ovation IX. Um, I think it's probably intuitive to most of you out there that do EVAR that by having a shorter neck indication that you may be able to get more patients into EVAR on strict IFU uh, applications. I think all of us are fully aware that as we start to deviate away from uh, indications for use on any device, you start to see a one-to-one uh, -one correlation of complications down the road. So with a shorter neck indication, I think logic 101 would dictate that you would see more and more patients falling under the applicability index, if you will. So what that allows is for a better seal in healthy tissue at the infrarenal position. Um, it's most certainly the shortest neck length indication available without the need for adjunctive device, such as the um, screws that we see uh, in the Aptis technology. Uh, and it allows you to deal with more challenging anatomies, such as hostile necks, large necks, reverse tapered necks, and conical necks. Uh, I think one of the most compelling reasons to be thinking about this particular technology is that uh, Many of my colleagues are very, very uh, uh, big fans of fenestrated devices. And we have to remember that uh, this Alto platform is on a 15 French uh, delivery system. And I guarantee you that anyone doing fenestrated uh, devices knows that a 15 French device would be beautiful if they could make that for fenestrated, but that is simply not the reality at this time. When we look at the M2S database, uh, I think it gives you a very, uh, I think, succinct idea of how this may change your considerations in the clinic when you're evaluating your patients for EVAR. Uh, looking at uh, the excluder and the zenith and the AFX, only about 50% of patients will uh, fall in the IFU category for neck length. Uh, with the IX and the Medtronic Endurant, about 67% would fall into that category. Uh, with the Alto at seven millimeters, that's about 79%. So clearly, if you're looking at just a simple device and ease of introduction into the external iliac, which is usually uh, the difficult uh, bottleneck, literally, uh, to advance a device, this is uh, without question a, a game changer. Now, of course, if, if that's not an issue, then you, you're going to be looking at other potentials, uh, such as the fenestrated devices I mentioned, as well as other devices using uh, the Helifex, or uh, as was known, the Aptis as well, uh, which in many cases uh, can be successful, but uh, increases uh, dramatically in terms of expense and risk if you're looking at potential uh, disruption or dissection of iliac vessels. Uh, when we look at the crossover lumen, you know, many uh, of you may not have a huge or high volume AAA practice. Um, and so your number of at-bats, if you will, for uh, selectively catheterizing the contralateral limb 
uh, you know, you may not have that much practice or, or what have you. And so that can lead to anxiety in these cases and having proctored many of these types of cases for, for different companies. I know that that's, a, that's an area that we don't speak about, but it's a reality for, for many of us that you just want to get in there and get the case done and get out. And when you have trouble struggling with selectively catheterizing that contralateral limb, it can be a huge headache. But with the integration of this crossover lumen, it's a simple matter of advancing an 014 into a specially designed port, which then allows for the 014 wire to be deflected through de the device and out the extern or the uh, contralateral limb to where you can easily snare it and then advance uh, another sheath and a wire and, and get on with the case. Uh, I think uh, that in combination with the uh, offset or staggered limbs, as I described before, uh, enhances the visibility and, and allows you for uh, a very high degree of confidence going into the case that this isn't going to be something that slows you down on a busy day. Let me go through uh, some bread and butter cases here for uh, what we've done uh, in Albuquerque here in our shop. So you'll see the aortogram here shortly. So a pretty straightforward long neck. Um, let me play that for you again, just so that you can see that clearly. So what you're seeing here is the inflation of the integrated balloon. The design of the uh, crown or the, the suprarenal fixation is such that um, the, the, de the deployment of the mid-crown uh, is facilitated by the integrated balloon. And so that is what the indications for use for this device describes the purpose of this balloon. So for those of you that aren't familiar with uh, the uh, ALTO deployment scheme, uh, this is uh, preceded by an unsheathing of the device. And then we go in and we inflate uh, the integrated balloon, and then the final step in uh, fixation is uh, releasing the um, uh, net one of the nested knobs so that the entire crown can ca have complete fixation um, into the aorta. So what you're seeing here is an aortogram uh, demonstrating the positioning of the ceiling, primary ceiling ring. Now, at this stage, we have not um, built out the uh, contralateral limb just yet. So I believe here what we're showing is uh, the uh, completion, and I'll show you that again. For those of you that have never deployed a polymer-based uh, EVAR device. The learning curve for these devices is quite simply uh, very flat. Um, the only difference is uh, understanding the nested knob configuration. Uh, and what that is is just a, a series of uh, three knobs that uh, assist in the deployment. It's virtually impossible to uh, miss a step or uh, have them uh, uh, confused in any way. It's, it's a very elegant design. And then the uh, use of the auto injector that plugs into the device also uh, allows for somewhat of a foolproof infusion of the polymer into the device. So other than those two steps, everything proceeds just like any other modular EVAR, uh, where you uh, perform a retrograde iliac angiogram on both sides measure out the distance from the limb, the, the, the iliac uh, gate, uh, down to the uh, internal iliac artery, and then you perform 
both limb deployments, which is just a pin and and, uh, and pull scheme. So uh, going on to the second case, which is uh, very much the same type of a bread and butter uh, type case, you'll see our aortogram here. And so you can see that the mid crown has been deployed and we're just maneuvering the markers of the device uh, precisely at the level of the uh, lowest renal. And we prefer to deploy the uh, markers right at the base of the ostium of the lowest renal. Um, I think that's a critical part of the finesse of this device. Uh, just knowing that uh, you uh, want to be able to precisely position that polymer ring so that you get an excellent seal. As I mentioned in the earlier uh, slide here, that's a, our retrograde iliac angiogram, uh, which we perform with uh, a measuring pigtail as you do with all EVARs. And you use that basically to uh, determine the precise length of the iliac limb of choice to finish out or round out the case. And what we're showing here is uh, the deployment of uh, the iliac limb, again, a pin and pull system, which begins typically at the half ring, uh, just below uh, the uh, ceiling rings at the top. And then here's your completion angiogram here. Actually, we've got uh, one more step, which is the deployment of the uh, ipsilateral limb. And here's a completion angiogram. So in summary, from, from my part here, I think what, what I'm possibly alluding to here is not so much a niche device for short necks, but uh, in my lab, what we did uh, back in 2012, 2013, is uh, fully commit to the idea of having uh, no outward radial force designs in my lab uh, so that we could uh, hopefully count on stability of these necks, you know, and it's been you know, seven years since we did our first uh, ovation device, I've never seen a type 1 endo leak, uh, and I've never had to uh, do a secondary intervention for a migration or type 3B. Uh, the stability over almost 300 of these types of device, I, I think, lends itself to uh, uh, the confidence that uh, my team has in this particular device. Uh, and I believe that the Alto can serve as a workhorse for uh, any EVAR scenario uh, based off of the M2S data set and the broad applicability of it. And with that, I'll turn it over to Nick for his presentation. Thank you, Steve. Um, I wasn't sure if Carlos was going to get on or not. But yeah, no, Carlos, go, are you? Go ahead, Dr. Go ahead, Dr. Mullet. I was just going to thank uh, Dr. Not for a section, but please, uh, you know, take over. Well, I appreciate that. And it's always, uh, thank you all for, for your time tonight. And it's always difficult to follow Steve. He's a, such an expert, has such a robust experience with this. But uh, um, I'm, I'm really happy to share my experience as well. I'm kind of in the mid-Michigan area, around an hour and a half more of, uh, north of Detroit. And um, been very interested in, in the adoption of polar based technology, primarily uh, due to decreasing or almost eliminating the chronic outward radial force and aneurysmal neck degeneration. So that's, as uh, Dr. Hanau was saying, is really the Achilles heel of, of uh, self-expanding statins at the level of the proximal aortic interrenal neck. Um, but <clears throat> when we deal with aneurysmal disease, we're always talking about the neck and we're always talking about the aneurysm itself. And uh, clearly those are very important. We want to make sure we're able to establish seal to uh, decrease and avoid pressurization of the aneurysm sac, which uh, obviously, you know, if we didn't, could ultimately lead to rupture. But I think as you start doing a lot more of these, I think uh, we tend to 
sideline or not really think that much about access. We're always focused about the neck, the inferior neck, the inferior neck. But, you know, if you can't get the delivery or you can't get the device to the appropriate position safely and successfully, uh, then you're not going to have the outcomes that you ultimately want to get. And so I think it's important to highlight that with the Alto device and this polymer-based technology, really it's the smallest and lowest profile delivery uh, system for endovascular management repair that is available on the market. Um, I can tell, I mean, my experience, you know, I think we've all had access side complications, particularly when we're doing fenestrated and larger profile devices. Uh, but if you have an opportunity here to use a smaller profile device, you can uh, decrease your access site complications. And this really uh, facilitates, you know, uh, PVAR, a technique for the management of, uh, of uh, aneurysmal disease. To the screen right, you can kind of see uh, the different devices kind of all in one, starting with the Zenith, which again is around 27 of the pop population, where we come down to the Alto, which uh, the OD is 15 French, which really addresses uh, over two thirds of the AAA population with regards to um, access site. And uh, ultimately, the ID ends up being a 13 French sheath if you want to end up uh, advancing further devices or balloons, as you will. So uh, I think the sheath itself molds quite nicely. Uh, it tracks very nicely. You have good coaxial support over your stiff wires. And so I think it's important that we remember that access is also very important, particularly as the patient population ages and um, we're seeing in more complex aneurysms. And how are they able to achieve this? And I think personally, this is really a genius component of engineering. Uh, you can see uh, to the screen left and the screen right, the, the two different modalities uh, between self-expanding stents and the concept of polymer-based technology. And really what it comes down to is they basically have separated uh, seal from fixation. Um, to the screen left, in the conventional, basically self-expanding stents, you have your uh, graft device to, to obtain uh, the seal that you need um, the, to obtain the seal, uh, as well as the stent is a, a design that gives you the fixation. And they're all kind of crunched into, uh, you know, a cylindrical tube that you ultimately advance over a stiff wire to the inferior neck. But uh, to the screen right with polymer-based technology, what happens is you end up advancing your uh, fixation, which is what's basically crunched into the cylindrical de device, a 15 French, and then after that happens, you're able to administer the polymer, which ultimately gives you the seal, based specifically on the inframenal neck and no chronic outward radial force. So that's how they're able to mitigate these larger size uh, sheaths by basically separating seal from fixation. To the screen left, you can see it from the Alto system, which is the newer one. Uh, the delivery system is 13 French ID. And they had a newer generation, a second generation auto injector, which is actually less than, it advances at less than one atmosphere, so at 0.8 atmospheres, uh, with their semi compliant integrated, which is different than uh, the Ovation IX uh, previous uh, model, uh, which uh, had, as you can see, their uh, 14 French OD or 14, 15 French based on what size um, O ring to use and the auto injector at one atmosphere. So, uh, it's 15 French OD, but you have a semi-compliant integrated balloon that's already available in there as compared to the other one. So some great modifications as compared to the previous iteration. And then here, to the screen right, we've kind of broken down uh, the different delivery steps with the nested knobs. Um, you can see that there's the integrated sheath with a 15 French outer diameter delivery catheter, which again allows for percutaneous delivery. And I, I suspect most people are doing PVAR and now, um, it really has allowed us to reduce the procedural steps. And again, over a stiff wire or a Lunderquist or Amplatz wire, it's really easily trackable with good coaxial support. Um, if you guys can see the, the screen, again, to the screen right, you can see the different components. And I think that's important. Uh, nowadays, there is the balloon line with a kind of a white uh, cap on it as well as uh, the uh, crossover guide wire lumen uh, that uh, Steve was talking about earlier, which basically removes all anxiety if you're concerned about trying to cannulate, particularly in larger aneurysms when, you know, the, the kind of the 3D space can make it quite difficult. Um, the green um, 
screen there uh, at the top of the screen there is the contralateral um, injector port. I think that's important uh, because it kind of reminds you when you get the auto injector, the kind of green to green. So I think that's important. It's very easy to use and uh, um, kind of very intuitive. So I think that helps when you're trying to use something that's newer for you. And then basically, like we discussed earlier, this ultra low profile and strong coaxial support and flexible device really allows you to, to treat over two thirds of the AAA population. And uh, I think initially, we're, a lot of people may be comfortable in the devices that they use and you have to find a niche for a new device. I really agree with Steve uh, on this and that it's not necessarily a niche device. I mean, it could be your workhorse device. I mean, you're treating over 70% plus of patients with from access, from uh, de delivery, and basically from neck uh, concerns or angulation, and this is able to treat them all um, with quite a large proportion of the different difficult types of aneurysmal disease that we see. So the integrated 15 French uh, sheath is basically designed to minimize vessel trauma and really reduce your procedural steps. And then uh, you can basically use these sheathless so that the device itself can be used with a sheath on its own. Um, to be able to treat uh, the, this patient population. And uh, again, there you can see, oh, I think I've already touched on this several different times, but I think that's really important. So low profile device, the shortest neck indication uh, out of any device that is on the market currently without the need for adjunctive uh, procedural uh, steps such as the aptus or a, a fenestrated component. I mean, I think again, you know, this is the Achilles heel. Uh, able to get a small device up that can treat the large proportion of patient population, I think it's a win-win situation. You see these compared to the traditional uh, self-expanding uh, proximal fixation devices to your screen left. And uh, to the screen right there also shows you there again, seven millimeter infrarenal neck indication with a 15 French outer uh, diameter uh, delivery device. So around 70% on IFU uh, for the management of patients with AAA disease. And uh, I really uh, interested uh, and like this integrated uh, semi-compliant balloon. Uh, it really uh, adds uh, or is another step different than the previous iteration of the Ovation IX, but it simplifies the procedure, quite frankly. It helps to open up the suprarenal segment. And then basically you can provide a stable inflation and retain your appropriate position uh, with a suprarenal stance. And then ultimately, uh, it really minimizes the need for further balloons. You don't have to open more balloons. It's all integrated. And so once you're done dealing and administering your proximal polymer fill for the proximal O-ring, this helps to kind of balloon it in place, get a good seal uh, at the inferior neck, and it's already all integrated. So you don't need to kind of move things back and forth. And I think that's important because these sheaths are long, and so you may have to have your lab bring longer balloons, longer catheter lengths to be able to manage this. So the fact that it's integrated kind of deals with the situation up front. And um, I think finally, before we talk about some cases, uh, I think anybody that's used the uh, Ovation IX limbs, um, love them. I mean, they are very, very, very conformable. Uh, they can challenge any other limb that's out there. Really no concerns in my uh, experience with limb occlusions. Uh, very, very minimal, but here you can see 1.2% limb occlusion rate at one year. I really have not seen that in my practice, but it's uh, highly conformable, um, and uh, it's basically composed of a nitinol stent with encapsulated in a, in a low PTFE um, engineering uh, segment to inhibit thrombosis and limb occlusions. And again, uh, in my personal experience, I really have not seen any limb occlusions at all with this. I like the fact that you have the opportunity to slinky them uh, where you want them to be. They're highly conformable and they really work well with tortuous iliacs. So from my point of view, low profile, can treat a wide variety of uh, aneurysmal disease, seven millimeter indication on label, and uh, limbs that are basically easily uh, and highly conformable kind of is a win-win for me. So I'll show you some of my cases, uh, or case or two here. Uh, this is one of our, actually, I think my first case that we did. Um, it was a large thrombus burn, obviously, you can see here in aortogram. It's more like aluminogram. It doesn't look that big, but it was big on CT. I don't know that anybody sees aneurysms like this anymore with a nice long neck. So I was quite happy with it. <laughs> and um, let me see if I get to the video. And uh, is that playing? So, 
that's our awardogram. Um, let me see that there. Um, I'm going to play it again for you all. Um, I wonder if you guys can see that. We're, we're seeing it okay, Nick. Okay, great. Can you guys hear it too? Oh, God. Yeah, we're picking up just a little bit of audio. We're asking for some technical technical help on that. But... Okay. I'm trying to get to the next one. And okay. I'm trying to get to the next one here. I just hope that it actually plays for you guys, but I don't know. Maybe I'll double click it and see. And I apologize if we can get to it. I'm not sure that's playing. Okay, there. And so you can see there, that's that's when we actually uh, deployed or administered the uh, polymer. I'm going to try to play that again, just double clicking it. And I'm sorry, because it's. I think it's lagging on my end over here, but I think it's, I'll just go to the next slide. I think I have it in picture format, which may make it easier. Um, there. So I think that's important. There. I think the offset uh, limbs are very important. Uh, I think uh, initially it can be it can be difficult because they're both side by side. You may have to do some adjunctive ballooning to make sure you're in the appropriate limb. But you can see here to uh, on the screen left the proximal ring, and that's the one that gives you the seal. Uh, the second ring that's a little bit lower is just to help advance the polymer. Uh, the polymer kind of goes up the ipsilateral side, up to the proximal O ring, and then back down the contralateral side. And then you can see here to the screen right how the two limbs are offset. And then we have our um, uh, pigtail to assist in basically identifying a retrograde sheathogram. So I'm going to get to the next video here. There. So that's after once we're completed there. Um, and so that's the completed aneurysm there um, with the endograft in place. I think the important thing that I just want to touch on real quick here is uh, something that's important that's different from the self-expanding stents is that the uh, the measurement of the infrarenal neck is very important. I know that we have some wiggle room. Um, um, there is uh, some wiggle room when you deal with self-expanding proximal fixation stents uh, where, you know, you have 10 or 15 millimeter infrarenal neck and, you know, oh, you may land a little higher or a little lower. Here, you know, where you plan on obtaining your seal is exactly where you plan on obtaining your seal. So in very short necks, and I think I'm going to try to show that in my next case, I, I want to touch on that a little bit because I think that's very important. Uh, that's what it looked like uh, on completion. I think some people worry, if you can see to the screen right, that the rings, uh, people worry that where the rings are, that lumen is a little bit smaller. It's not. It just looks that way because of the way the polymer is. It's kind of like a visual um, trick, I guess. Uh, I was concerned about that initially, and I uh, ivised it. Everything looks totally fine. It looks fine on completion CT uh, when they come back post-operatively. But here, it's because of the way the polymer is. It makes you... Uh, wonder about that but this patient did great um this is the the other one again uh, i'm sorry the images don't project very well here unfortunately i'm sorry uh, i'm going to try to get to the video and i think this is important this is one that we just did this past week and and let me see and it was a it was a very short neck as you can see large uh, aneurysm and it was a short neck and that's really what i wanted to harp on uh when it comes to the management of this, is that like, you know, if it, it, you, when you select your seven mil, where the infrarenal or the IR seven, which is the infrarenal seven uh, position, seven millimeters, the distal to the, to the infrarenal neck, that's where you have to land uh, your um, oh, um, alto device. Because if the neck gets much larger distal to that, you're not going to get seal. So it's very important that you're very calculated when it comes to where you want to land that. And so that's all done with a preoperative CT and then you can you know, get the seal that you need as necessary. Let me get to the next video here. I think I may have blown it up uh, a little bit for you all, but let me see. Hopefully it goes through. So it's kind of a really short neck. It's, that was really important. Again, generally speaking, for other uh, devices uh, that are available, I'm not sure we were able to be able to treat that with any without any adjunctive um, 
um, like apt to screws or whatever. But here with the fact that we had that all to, we were able to treat this patient uh, successfully. And I'll get to that in our next images over here. That was the initial one, so I'll get to the last one. They're a little bit out of order there, so. Yeah, and again, so that was the completion. Uh, uh, aortogram after the endovascular repair. Again, I understand that even me, sometimes we worry about that proximal neck, that it looks unusual. It's just something you just got to get used to with polymer technology. Um, you have the integrated balloon. We do inflate the balloon. We get a good seal. It's obviously all uh, um, uh, measured according to the CT scan. And again, I've been in situations where I have ibistat just to make sure because I was like, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. And in fact, everything looks perfectly fine. There's no narrowing at the proximal neck whatsoever. So it's not like it moves inwards. And um, I believe that's actually it uh, for my cases. Thank you, Dr. Mawad. Uh, apologies here for the technical difficulties. Hopefully, yeah, uh, I apologize. For this. No, 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 no worries. That's on our end here. Uh, so, thanks for being patient with us, and thanks for the audience uh, for tuning in. So, uh, I'd like to encourage uh, folks that are tuned in today. If you do have a question, uh, again, the small little Q and A uh, box is the the best way to get those questions in. I'm going to, you know, moderate the session here with uh, Dr. Sanao and and Mawad. And maybe I'll, I'll start with seeding a question to uh, uh, both uh, you, Steve, and, and Nick. You know, when you think about uh, Alto, and now that you've kind of done your first cases, and you, you know, you both obviously have, you know, a, a good foundation in terms of experience with polymer technology. What what role do you see it playing today in in, in your vascular practice? Uh, maybe, uh, Doctor, now you can just kick us off on that. Well, I mean, I believe strongly that uh, we have to be looking at uh, the vascular space as probably the, the most prone to innovation um, for, for the surgical subspecialties. And, and it's an exciting time to be part of it. So those of you that may or may not be seeing this that are potentially looking at fellowships and what have you, this is, this is why I believe uh, vascular surgery is such a cool field. Um, when I had the opportunity to uh, look at um, something outside of my comfort zone for EVAR, um, I quite literally leapt at the chance because the technology and the engineering seemed to be so compelling. Uh, with the previous generation of devices, such as the uh, Ovation IX, you know, having five-year data uh, in the Encore data set, which you can, you can look up in PubMed, um, there is uh, a lot, uh, I think, to be uh, considered regarding uh, low reintervention rate and low morbidity and mortality. Uh, now with the Alto, looking at a seven millimeter indication, um, you just have to be very aware of the role of uh, EVAR and utilization of the uh, indications for use or the IFU for these devices. So when we look at that broad applicability, if you're not considering this as a workhorse platform, my question to everyone in the audience would be, why not? W what is it about this that you wouldn't consider uh, in looking at all of your AAAs? That, that to me is the most compelling. Yeah, I completely agree with, with Steve on that. I think uh, it's exciting. Uh, to be able to continue to be part of the leading curve on the management of vascular disease. And obviously, EVAR has taken the world by storm. And, uh, you know, we know the patients have progressive disease. And I always kind of tell uh, the students and fellows at times, like, you know, you have to learn how to fail forward. So I have a plan in case something bad happens down the line because the patients are uh, living longer and doing better. Well, here in this situation, based on even the data that, that Steve was discussing earlier, I mean, there's really no aneurysmal neck degeneration up to five years out. And so, uh, you know, clearly it's much more complicated to deal with delayed type 1A endo leaks or aneurysmal neck degeneration. Now you're talking about building more proximal FIVARs and SHIVARs and BVARs and all that, and that clearly increases uh, cost, uh, increases uh, level of complexity and difficulty, uh, increases radiation to the patient and yourself, as the uh, provider and, and so forth. And so uh, 
the science makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And um, it doesn't have to be a niche device. Like I said, you know, we worry about the aneurysm, we worry about the infernal neck, we worry about the axis vessels. Uh, you got the smallest profile, you got the lowest uh, infernal neck indication without any extra stuff. Um, it treats a large proportion of population, particularly older females that have smaller access vessels. I mean, there's really no reason to not try it or consider it um, for the for for the management of patients with AAA disease. Great, thank you, thank you both for that perspective. Uh, maybe, maybe another question for for the the, the two of you, and and, and maybe and Nick, you could start us off. You know, obviously here in the audience, we probably have uh, folks that. Are at different levels of familiarity and you know kind of the experience curve with uh, you know polymer technology. Um, if if you were to kind of maybe share what you've learned in your experience and then the curve you are in, uh, obviously Nick, you, you're you're just shy of almost 50 cases under your belt, and Dr. Now, as you alluded to, you you've kind of been uh, on this ride since the beginning with almost 300. You know what what are, what are some of your lessons learned? What are some tips and tricks or you know, nuggets of knowledge that you would pass on to, you know, folks that might be early in their experience curve, maybe somewhere in the middle, and maybe someone that uh, now has a few under their belt. Uh, what, what, what would you share? Um, I'll take that one first. Uh, um, I, I think the most important thing, uh, in, in my opinion, for people starting to use polymer technology uh, is, uh, well, first of all, I think you should give it a shot. Uh, but second of all, it has to do with the preoperative planning. I think that's the most important, in my opinion. Uh, and I, I think I've alluded to that a couple of times throughout the presentation. A lot of times you think that, based on the other device with a self-expanding stent, kind of outward radial force of, you know, 20% or more to kind of get that fixation. Uh, here, like I said, where you decide to place your O-ring seal is critical. And I think that's very, very important. So particularly for patients that have short necks, uh, you know, seven millimeter, eight millimeter, whatever, 10 millimeter, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and I think that's important because if you decide to, let's say, uh, cheat a little lower, you may be in an area where you're not going to get any seal at all. You have to make sure that you're uh, placing uh, your um, O-ring where you want it to be. And I think that that's difficult for people to uh, think about up front because usually you have a little bit of a wiggle room where you can, like I said, cheat a little higher or cheat a little lower, and you tend to do relatively okay. Uh, and so I think that's very, very important. And um, you know, watching these patients, you know, for for years now, I'd say um, five, six years or so, um, I, in my personal uh, practice, have not seen uh, any uh, issues with aneurysmal neck degeneration, um, assuming that it was planned appropriately at the index operation. So I think you should give it a shot. It's different. It's 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 different, and I, and I res respect that and I accept that. Uh, but uh, we're trying to take care of these patients, and you know, if that was the case, we would have, we would have never done Evar ever 20 years ago. So I think uh, there's an opportunity to continue to push the envelope forward, and we want to be at the leading edge of that. Great, thanks, Dr. Mawad. How about uh, Dr. Now? Uh, what 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 do you have for us? I think what I would probably recommend everyone in the audience consider is uh, why they select uh, a particular device for uh, EVAR uh, to begin with. You know, start start from there. I think a lot of us consider EVAR devices based off of our relationship to the industry. Uh, you may love the rep, and they may have taught you how to do EVAR from the very beginning, and you're comfortable with them, and. They do a good job at supporting your cases and all this other stuff. And, you know, as, as physicians and scientists at heart, I believe that's the most absurd reason to uh, decide what you're going to be doing to take care of a human being. I think that's lazy and I think it's inappropriate. And I see that in other device realms as well, such as, uh, you know, the recent uh, uh, development of uh, drug eluding technologies for the SFA. And there's a lot of robust evidence to say you should be using one device and not another. Yet, it seems like those considerations are thrown out the window for reasons that have nothing to do with science and ultimately have nothing to do with the patient. So um, that's kind of what I would do uh, more from a philosophical standpoint is really stop to think about why it is that you decide on a particular EVAR device. Uh, and then go from there. 
and and this is definitely a platform that should have uh, quite a bit of consideration if you're looking at it from that point of view. Fantastic, thanks, uh, Doctor, and I appreciate the, uh, the the insight there. Uh, so again, just a reminder for the audience: if you do have a question, uh, feel free to uh, put it into the Q and A box, and we'll we'll get it here uh, in front of uh, our esteemed guest. So we do have the first question coming in, um, and uh, maybe. Uh, uh, Doctor, now you can start us off with this one. The, the, the question is, you know, for you know peers uh, of yours that believe that you know short necks uh, should be treated with uh, fenestrated devices. You know, uh, given given the uh, obviously the seven millimeter neck indication that you kind of highlighted here for Alto, uh, how, how do you how do you reply to a peer of yours uh, presenting that? Do you look at you know, complications, cost, outcomes to determine what you should do for that patient? How, how do you approach that? Um, I think I would approach it very delicately. Um, there's data to support that it takes uh, surgeons about 15 years sometimes to change their mind about how they do things. So obviously you're dealing with a stubborn group of people. Uh, but again, I think going back to my last comment, uh, we need to be considerate about uh, the patient and the anatomy and uh, everything you discussed, including cost, including complications. I mean, you can't compare a 15 French to a 20 plus French device, uh, nor can you compare the uh, amount of radiation exposure to yourself, to your team, to the patient. Um, the, 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 it's just orders of magnitude more complex for a fenestrated device. Um, and you know, quite simply, I think it's unnecessary. It's it's uh, taking a shotgun to a fly. Um, if if you can do it with a three part device uh, in a cheaper and simpler way, uh, why aren't you doing that? And I think there's a certain amount of bravado that happens when you do a fenestrated case. Uh, it, it's nice to feel cool, but after a while, you got to get over it. You know, do what's right for the patient and get in and get out. And I think this device fits the bill quite often. Great, thanks, Dr. Now, how about the, uh, your perspective, Dr. Mwab? Yeah, I, I agree with Steve on that. I think, you know, you know the, the, the short answer is the science makes sense. The engineering, uh, you know, supports the, the science. And just try it. I mean, just, just try it. You know, if it's going to take you, if you're going to be comfortable doing what you're going to be comfortable with. And I, and I can and respect that. And so you're going to have to step outside, uh, you know, your comfort zone. And that's fine. You know, maybe don't use, don't do it on the craziest case you can find. But try it on a, uh, try it. And, and you'll, you'll find out that for people have done hundreds, like, like Dr. Hanau, and, and for me, have done a lot of them too. We're not seeing uh, these concerns that everyone else is, you know, hypothesizing. Uh, in these shorter necks, if you will, I'm not. We're not saying do it in a you know two millimeter in, you know neck, but for for the ones there that you know generally speaking, people want to do a fenestrated. This does very well with lower cost, lower radiation uh, to both the patient and yourself. And of course, follow the patient, follow the outcomes, and you'll see that the data will, speaks for itself. Great, thank you both. Um, you know, you guys touched upon something that's, uh, you know, very important. I mean, uh, when we look at, you know, obviously from an endologic point of view, we have a, you know, a good basis of clinical evidence around the technology itself with our Encore data and, you know, more recently with Elevate for Alto. Um, you guys both highlighted kind of what you're seeing in your experience now that you have many of these cases uh, under your belt in the long term. Maybe if uh, you could maybe spend a, a, a few minutes just, you know, maybe describing what you're seeing and follow up for those patients that you traded early on with the technology and, and uh, maybe Dr. Malawi, you can start us off there. Yeah, um, uh, and I, I think I've been harping on it a little bit throughout the, the webinar tonight, but I, I think that's important. I think once you decide to try something new and step out of, you know, the, the zone that you're used to, uh, is that you look at your own data and look at your own patient and make sure that the outcomes are commensurate with what you want. And in my uh, experience thus far, I've really, you know, up to five years, um, it would be up to six years now, I have not seen any of them. And I follow them very, very closely, obviously at least an annual um, imaging for any person that undergoes endovascular aneurysm repair. And I have not seen 
uh, limb occlusions, and I have not seen aneurysmal neck degeneration in this cohort of patients that underwent polymer-based technology um, with the, the uh, with, with a polymer-based endograft, basically. And, and that's and that's actually just the frank truth. Uh, you know, were some cases more complicated than others to do? Did we have to extend and so forth? Of course. But overall, the things that concern me the most are obviously um, repressurization of the aneurysm sac with an endoleak. Um, and so because that obviously means that the aneurysm is not treated. And I have not seen that to be a problem for me uh, in the cohort of patients I've treated with this thus far. Thanks, Dr. Mawad. Uh, Dr. Now, your perspective? You know, I think like, like Nick's practice and like many of my colleagues' practice, um, we have the privilege of being quite capable of doing open thoracoabdominal repair, fenestrated stent grafting, and, and our, as well as uh, chimney and, and, and what have you. Um, so it, it's nice to know that there's somebody out there like myself that has patients that have had this particular type of polymer implanted in them for now, I think, uh, seven years, I believe, that we've got uh, uh, at least single center data, uh, which is imminently going to be published, that demonstrates no evidence of migration, no evidence of infrenal neck uh, deterioration, uh, and secondary interventions were uh, literally like almost uh, single digits. And those were mainly for... Um, possibly type two endoleaks or something that regardless of the endograft, you were gonna get a type two, um, you know, large lumbars and uh, patent IMAs and what have you. So, you know, my, my sense of it is, is that this technology is, is certainly something that uh, needs to be considered a workhorse device. I'm, I'm, I'm very vocal about that because the minute you start to niche a device and you have the one or two offers your team isn't used to it. You're probably not used to it. And, you know, this is a device that's a precision instrument. So what Nick was spot on, where you place that primary sealing ring is precisely where you're going to get the seal. And if you're not careful and you have a maldeployment or a geographic miss and you get a type 1 endoleak, you shouldn't be too upset at anyone but yourself because you didn't do the homework or you weren't careful in the deployment or what have you. And, and so I'm, I'm really kind of a stickler for this when I go and I um, proctor these cases is making sure that as all surgeons know, you're responsible for the outcome of where that scalpel goes on, on what have you or where that dissection plane is that you're using. It's the same, it's surgery. And surgery is a precision art and a science and this device is no different. But I think the more that you use this device, the more expertise you will develop and the more optimal the results that you will get. And I, I feel very strong on that. Fantastic. Thanks, Dr. Now. Appreciate the perspective. And, uh, you know, just being conscious and being respectful of everybody's time, I'm just going to take one last question here and then we could wrap it up. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Hanna, maybe you can kick us off on this one, and, and obviously Dr. Mawai would love to hear your thoughts, too. Um, so the, the, the question is the following. Uh, obviously, you know, today's medicine, it's very important uh, to be on-label, and we all know what the data is telling us about on- versus off-label um, outcomes. Uh, at your respective, you know, hospitals or your experience with administrators, do you see concerns uh, growing for off-label or off-IFU procedures? I wouldn't worry so much about the administrators, and I'd worry more about the medical legal manifestations of that. I think it's extremely uh, uh, important to know that the onus is, is, uh, is on us uh, to make sure that we're providing uh, a fully informed consent to our patients and their families regarding having to drift off the IFU. And that happens sometimes. Patients may not be good candidates for the thoracoabdominal exposure uh, or an aortic cross clamp or something, you know, because of many times uh, comorbidities that are gigantic. Um, so I, I think it's important. But that being said, you know, we should make every effort to stay on the IFU when possible. 
And I think sometimes that decision process can be clouded by maybe previous technical success. I want to reiterate, EVAR has absolutely nothing to do with technical success at the time of surgery. We're seeing these patients living longer and longer. And just because the angiogram at the end of your, you know, brand X EVAR was fantastic, it doesn't mean that that's uh, applicable to, you know, year five and year 10. That's simply not the case. So uh, when you drift off of the IFU and you get away with it, I think you just need to know that maybe you just got away with it, but you didn't see the complication. Many times we don't see our own complications. They go across the street. Um, and so that needs to be a strong consideration on how important it is to be on the IFU from here going forward, especially. Thank you, Dr. And now, Dr. Mawadi, your thoughts? Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I completely agree. I, I wouldn't worry about the hospital administrator. I'd worry about medical legal. And, I mean, and more importantly than that, actually, is the patient. I mean, we know that if you're off IFU, things don't work out the way you're supposed to. And uh, in, in my opinion, again, this is what I find so fantastic about the Alpha device itself, because you're on IFU for over two-thirds or 70-plus percent of the patients that have aneurysmal disease. Uh, it, it covers all that. So you don't even have to worry about the, uh, being off IFU because this covers a significant proportion of patients that have AAA disease. Fantastic. Well, you know, uh, with those uh, last thoughts, uh, I just want to, on behalf of Endologics, uh, thank Dr. Anau and Dr. Mawad for uh, joining us today. Uh, your insights, uh, knowledge, and perspective, and especially sharing your cases with us are very important as we continue to showcase Alto and obviously as people learn the therapy and, and continue to uh, apply it to their patients. Um, with that said, on behalf of Endologics to all our audience members, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we appreciate uh, your patience with some of the little technical difficulties today, but hopefully not too bad. Uh, hopefully this uh, session has been very informative to you all. Uh, and again, thank you for uh, you know spending part of your evening here with us. Um, with that, thank you very much and enjoy your evening. Take care. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.